What's up everyone? This is Dariusz Kalbarczyk, co-founder of MG Poland, JS Poland, AngularMaster.dev and WorkshopFest.dev. Welcome back to Angular Master Podcast. Today we've got a special guest from Google USA. Firebase team member, Angular New York City organizer, creator of the CodeLab.fun platform. Ladies and gentlemen, here JS. Hi, Kier. Hey, Derek. How are you? I'm doing great, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Okay, thank you so much for being with us today. Okay, so tell us a little bit about yourself. So I work at uh, Firebase and I live in uh, New York. Just moved to Brooklyn Well, in the beginning of COVID, so not just anymore, but uh, I'm in Brooklyn right now. Um, doing lots of Angular, we're like a pretty large Angular project inside of Google. Um, and uh, I've been organizing Angular Meetup in New York for a while, probably four or five years, uh, but not that much with COVID. And uh, lots of Angular things. I have a code lab. It's uh, codelab.fun. Um, which is interactive Angular uh, tutorial. Uh, I should probably update it. It's a few years uh, old, although not that much of Angular changed. Uh, but since that time, a lot of uh, new cool uh, courses came up. So maybe I should catch up. Um, and then I've been doing lots of streams um, about Angular, but recently mostly mostly in Russian. Okay, that's amazing. So let's talk about uh, your Angular meetup. I am the also the organizer of uh, Warsaw meetup and Krakow meetup, so two meetups in Poland. Nice. And so it's uh, it's uh, really hard to organize meetup these days. By the way, we have today Angular Warsaw meetup uh, in person. So oh, no. the first time in two years, I think. My so, plane is in a few hours, so I'll miss that, but that's, that's sad. I'll yeah, that's that. sad. Exactly. That's sad. Because you fly today at five. Yeah? Yes. Okay. Yes. By the way, you are in Warsaw. Yes. Now, what I, are you doing in Warsaw? Well, before we start talking about, about the Angular meetup, let's, uh, let's talk about your, your visit in Warsaw. Yeah, it's a, a long story, uh, but in the end, uh, I've been in Kishinev, Moldova. I don't know who knows that country. Um, and I had to fight back, uh, but it got postponed. And um, basically, the next option was in November. And uh, the thing was happening mid-September. And <laughs> I was hoping to get home faster. Uh, and uh, I asked if there were flights with a longer layover. And I said, yeah, you have 35 hours in war, so... And I was like, that's amazing. Uh, I had a like, few hour layover in Warsaw and I was able to get out and I, I had a great time. Um, so yeah, I wrote to Derek and Derek was super nice and we met with him and explored Warsaw. It was amazing. Thank uh, you. Great ice cream. <laughs> and I tried my uh, Polish, which is basically I speak Russian and I insert bzipsh everywhere. And uh, I don't think people understood me. but <laughs> Yeah, fun. but a lot of people understand uh, Russian language, yeah, so in Poland, especially here, yeah. Yeah, lots of the words are similar. Yeah, yeah, so it's it's really cool. Yeah, and now okay. I'm here. So. Uh, how, how was the Angular meetup so it last was, two years? It, it, was, uh, it was basically non-existing. Um, and I remember like um, a few, few years ago when I was wanted to organize a meetup, uh, there was Andres who was organizer at the time. And... Um, he was complaining how, oh, it's so hard. And I had lots of energy and I was like, I'll organize it. And uh, I kind of didn't understand his vibe. Um, and uh, it was f super fun for a while. Like you get to meet like super cool people and uh, lots of great Angular developers visit New York. And then you just uh, message them and say, hey, you should come. And then you get to hang out with them. You get to learn from them. Uh, you get some awesome talks and you basically decide what the content is. And... Uh, uh, by the time uh, I started organizing the meetup, there was like already an audience, so I would get like 100, 200 people uh, coming every month. And it was amazing for a while, but over time you basically start getting tired because uh, it never stops. Um, like may maybe you can, uh, so sometimes you can take a uh, summer break, uh, but basically like, every month you have to find people, you have to figure out the space, you have to get everything ready, and you cannot take a break. Uh, which is uh, 
kind of similar to what happened when I uh, I got a baby. I have a baby who's almost two years now, and you just just have you just have to deliver every time, and that that part was kind of exhausting. Uh, and then what happened is uh, I found some other org- organizers and they started helping me. And that worked for another couple of years. And then COVID and baby and basically everything stopped. Okay. So, um, I saw many people uh, using COVID as an opportunity to try new formats, which I think is amazing. And one thing I tried is uh, I, I did a stream where I would, uh, we can talk about it later, but I tried contributing to Angular uh, moderately successfully. Uh, but not that many people showed up, and that is probably because um, uh, we haven't had events for a while, so no consistency, no momentum, and that didn't work that well. Uh, but I'm thinking of uh, trying something again now, especially hearing, like being inspired by you keeping it uh, in Warsaw. Yeah, so um, as I said, it is first time in, in, I don't know, two years maybe. I'm so excited because it's... <sighs> I love to meet people in person. It's of course we can talk um, using Zoom. We can talk using I don't know Facebook. By the way, Facebook yesterday was dead, so we 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 need to talk about that later. Yes. Okay. So, but but um, in general, uh, when you meet people, when you talk to people, when you share the room, it's totally different. Yep, and also after the meetup, you basically go, go with the same people for drinks or uh, for, yeah. uh, for chill, and you catch up, and like everybody has things happening in the last year, uh, you know, in, in in the preciding month. And yeah, exactly. So, so it's so it's really really important for us as a people. Yes, and yeah, similar so. to conferences, like there are so many conferences which moved online, but it's just not the same. Like when I go to conferences, I rarely see talks. I mostly go to talks just to support uh, the speakers, uh, but most of the time I just hang out outside and like talk to to people because I can't watch talks uh, in, like double speed later. And uh, with that missing, I kind of don't see much of a point to go to a conference anymore. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's why we do everything we can to organize this year NG Poland and JS Poland uh, in person. Let's back to Facebook. <laughs> Yesterday, uh, Facebook and WhatsApp and Instagram was just that. How you survive? Yeah, so yesterday I took a scooter and I got a nice meal and I uh, walked around Warsaw and then I met with Derek and then I met with some other friend and then I came home and there are like trillion messages everywhere about Facebook being broken. So I completely missed that, uh, but it sounds like it was a fun time, especially yeah. for people who rely uh, on Facebook to talk to like their relatives or like uh, their friends. Uh, it sounds pretty bad. And um, I'm, I'm curious in Poland, and what's the alternative to Facebook? Like, if the Facebook down, how would you communicate with the um, It's, I don't know, Twitter. Twitter was <laughs> alive. So <laughs> yes, I, I Everybody to used Twitter yes. and LinkedIn. And, LinkedIn? Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Uh, so, so we mostly, like in Russia, we mostly use uh, Telegram, uh, which is a pretty interesting uh, network. Uh, one thing I really like about it is uh, the way it works with post is kind of more ethical than what uh, Facebook does or Twitter. Uh, So anybody can create a channel and uh, nobody knows who's posting in the channel unless you disclose it. And uh, people can subscribe to channels, but there is no feed or anything and they explicitly are not doing that. So... If you are subscribed for something, you get this information. And if you're not, you don't get to see that. And this means that uh, Telegram basically cannot uh, manipulate uh, what, what you see with like recommendations or like Twitter inserts something because you might like it or your friends like it, even though like you probably don't care about this thing. And I think that's very nice. And another interesting thing in Telegram, uh, you can comment on posts, uh, but it's in a chat format. So you... Uh, if people get angry, this basically <laughs> happens real time. Uh, but generally, I, I see it's it's being okay. Like I haven't seen that much drama on Telegram. Surprisingly, Twitter is like much much hotter in that regard. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I need to try this Telegram. Yeah. I never tried so. Uh, yeah, but seems that seems it's really good. 
there are like uh, so there is the whole story and the person who created it, Pavel Durov, uh, he created a Russian version of Facebook called Vkontakte, and that was very popular uh, for a while, and then he created Telegram kind of as a... So far, it seems like uh, this is a great way to communicate. It has also, besides channel, it has chats, uh, group chats with uh, lots of people. And, uh, for example, I am an admin in uh, Angular Russia channel, and we have like 6,000 people. And there are like hundreds and thousands of messages every day of peeping, uh, people asking their Angular questions and getting help. Um, so it's pretty cool if uh, if you have other people there uh, so uh, one thing I was thinking, maybe I'll do it later, is uh, creating an English-speaking channel or maybe joining one which exists, probably something related to Angular, and then trying to build a community there. Um, I know there is something in the Discord or in Slack, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So may- maybe it's not even needed. Actually, D- Discord seems like an interesting alternative. I've seen like so many, especially like on TypeScript, uh, there are like so many channel, there are like so many bots and stuff. And if you need help, help, you get a special room just for your personal question. And then a bunch of people answer you, and it's just you. They just uh, now nobody is allowed to ask any other questions, and that is also pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the, maybe the main question is what is the difference between uh, like a Discord and uh, uh, this uh, Telegram? Yeah. So it seems like Telegram uh, so far keeps it, keeps it simple. Okay. Uh, because in Discord uh, you get one community and you have like lots of chats, uh, different chat groups around that. While in uh, Telegram you just get to get one chat group and then you have to figure it out, and then. Uh, yeah, you, you cannot have like mul- like a community of multiple things. So I think maybe Discord even is a better fit for things like uh, TypeScript or Angular Group, for example. Okay, okay. Uh, you mentioned the Vkontakte mm-hmm. uh, application. It's it's similar to like a Facebook or like a LinkedIn yes. or it's uh, it's basically like Russian clone of Facebook. It also has like similar colors, similar okay. functionality, uh, very very similar. Okay, color yeah. also. Oh. Yes. Uh, but it's uh, so f- for a while it was like uh, a place where the young people went. Yeah. Uh, but uh, now with the government owning it, it's it, it's kind of weird. It's kind of split. Like some people still use it, but most of the people just went away. Okay. Okay. Mostly to Telegram. And Facebook is uh, popular in Russia or not? Uh, maybe among o- older people. Okay. Kind of similar to like what what it is okay. in the states. So yeah, uh, I, I have it. And I pretty much don't use it. Okay. It's crazy how it works because uh, Facebook was so popular. Mm-hmm. And now the youngest people just didn't like Facebook because Facebook is for old people. And it's wow. Yeah, And then I think at some point they basically screwed it up. And uh, because of the recommendation system and the timeline, which I was talking about, something Telegram doesn't have, it just turns turned into like a bunch of memes which people share and like funny cat videos and yeah. other crap. Uh, and I had a picture of this, and I, basically that's why I stopped using it. Uh, but I looked at it recently, and mostly it was a post from like my friends, and it was actually pretty good. Like the timeline was interesting, uh, but I kind of just don't feel it anymore. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Okay, let's talk about streams, the alternative uh, for the in-person meetings. Yes, so after after the Angular meetup uh, was done, I kind of didn't do anything for a while, uh, but I was missing uh, connection. So at some point, I was just writing some code on the weekend, and I'm like, I, I should stream that. And I started streaming that, and I got like <laughs> two people. And actually, I had another attempt a few years ago with a friend. We were working on the code lab thing, and we had some like really uh, advanced stuff where we're working on um, real time editor where you type something, some, some Angular code, and it gets compiled uh, on the fly, and then it uh, create uh, creates an app on the iframe and at the same time it runs unit tests to verify that you actually wrote the right thing and then we, we've been working on that uh, with with a friend and we streamed that 
and we got like two, 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 three people watching, but there were like nine hour streams, like really advanced. Uh, unfortunately, I lost all the videos of that. Um, oh so, no! Uh, yeah, nine but, hours, man. Yeah, there, there was like some That's like crazy. really advanced stuff, uh, yeah. and but it, it was fun. Uh, but due to low demand. <laughs> basically stop doing that and at some point i just thought okay i know how to stream i have the setup so i should do it again and i started it again and I, again i got like uh, two people and um, i thought that uh, before covid you basically you get to go to meetups you meet people and uh, you have to talk to local people but now i can basically stream for people from anywhere and because i basically start started forgetting russian language i felt like why would i stream in russian and all my friends can participate and i started inviting people and even now like i stream in russian and every time i stream i have um, a uh, link where anybody can join with uh, in the voice chat and they can also participate uh, so i started streaming and it was very slow for a while uh, but then people started coming and then at some point it was like seven people People and I was like, wow, that's a lot of people. And then it was uh, 10 people. And then I just, uh, coming from vacation, like for uh, two months, I didn't do anything, didn't stream. But towards the end, I had some streams uh, where I had like 80, 90 people uh, max, which was like uh, yeah. very, very live chat, very active. And the average uh, streams would be getting like 30, 40 people and uh, also like very active. And what, it was kind of, kind of magical because uh, uh, one uh, of the type of stream I was, do, was doing, but mostly I was doing just uh, working on some Angular project. Uh, there is a curse. If you start streaming, you have to have uh, your own uh, uh, overlay for streaming. Uh, otherwise, you're not a real streamer. So, of course, I had, <laughs> I had to do that. <laughs> I had like uh, 30 ep episodes uh, two to five hours each of me doing that and fighting with YouTube API. And um, it's pretty cool when you're like really, really stuck and like something doesn't work and you hate everything and then somebody comes in and say, oh, like you missed one character and then suddenly it works and it feels so cool. Um, what kind of software you use for streaming? Uh, so it's a, it's a long story, but uh, uh, in order to stream and... Uh, at the same time, build Angular, I think you have to have M1 uh, MacBook or something. Because my MacBook was like extremely slow. Like I was getting up to one minute builds okay. uh, just because of streaming. Uh, so in the end, I came up with a weird setup. And uh, I don't know, maybe I don't know how to find the right information, but there is very little information about uh, how to set things up properly. Uh, and for... Uh, uh, programmer streamers even less because very few streamers uh, stream programming there are like a couple of like really huge channels where they do like uh, some light stuff or like hardware stuff uh, but mostly like there's not much information but what I ended up doing is I have a separate box which I plug in into my laptop and it acts like a monitor and it takes this picture and it sends it to a different laptop which uses OBS and then that goes uh, to the stream so I, it has to be two laptops uh, for now. And I recently discovered there are actually like other boxes uh, because I tried uh, traveling with like two laptops and giant microphone and it didn't go really well. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm still figuring it out and there is not uh, that much material. So if anybody knows uh, what a good streaming setup is, please let me know. Okay, yeah. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's hard to start streaming and be you know everything set up and um, so stream in the, the same the same time and um, working on some very uh, large project for example yeah so the build is the first thing yes I think like yeah. the most discouraging thing is like when there are just two people. And yeah like and they don't write anything in the chat and i was yeah. lucky because there was like uh, one person who just kept coming to every stream and was very active and that helped me survive like for the first yeah. uh, like 10 uh, episodes and after it it got better uh, but yeah it's kind of you have to go through these discouraging moments and then it gets better and better and i also see uh, uh, some people streaming in English. Uh, for example, Josh Goldberg is doing uh, some cool TypeScript stuff. Uh, we actually had uh, a stream episode on my channel where we contributed to TS-ESLint, I think. 
or like somewhere in that area, we were going to contribute to one project, but then we accidentally opened the other one and contributed there and then realized it was not the right project. But <laughs> in, anyway, and it was a very cool experience uh, because um, we're both uh, have like many, many years of experience. And Josh is, I think he's like a staff uh, senior engineer in the Code Academy, and he's very cool. He contributed to TypeScript. And then it still took us like two, three hours to figure out like what the prob- problem is, uh, to debug it. And then in the end, we kind of fixed uh, one or two lines of c- code. And that was a cool experience. Yeah, it, it's similar to when you are on the conference and live coding is always uh, something, it's always <laughs> going something wrong. Yes. And yeah, it's... But you know what uh, streaming is really similar to is uh, job interviews. You okay. have to write code and explain it. And I don't know, I have a theory that people who stream, they will be like very, very good at job interviews. I haven't done myself in a while, but I, that would be my guess because uh, you learn to kind of have uh, a set extra operating memory for explaining what you're doing. Yeah. You don't have to think about it anymore. So yeah, that. exactly. Let's talk about uh, codelab.fun. What is this and why you create it? So it was a long story too. I, uh, I've been teaching. We have an internal course at Google. And uh, I've been teaching that for a while. And at some point, uh, I had to create... Uh, we're going to like China, I think. And uh, we wanted an external version of the course. And I basically took the same uh, material. But there was some problem because internal course we have two days. But uh, for external course, we had just four hours. And I was like, how are we going to fit uh, two days of material in just like four hours? And I, get, I mean, the simple answer is you don't. So I only took the first day. And um, the next thing was, uh, what I did is I found that it was taking lots of time to set things up. So you have to go through the manual. And of course, it says, uh, please do this in advance. And of course, nobody ever does anything in advance. And even like some people do, uh, most of the others uh, don't. So it kind of slows things down. So I thought, okay, if uh, all of this stuff will be happening in the browser, then you don't have to set up. So I created like an interactive uh, runner for uh, Angular code. And uh, also I mentioned that before, you also got unit tests because uh, it uh, always took some time to understand what exactly the... So there were like a small unit and then there was like a small task to complete. And to explain this task, it was not always uh, very obvious. So some people would uh, keep asking the teachers and TAs like, what exactly do you want from us? And what I did is I wrote a set of unit tests which uh, basically were saying, oh, do this uh, small part of the task do another small part of the task. And uh, this all ran in the browser, and uh, eventually I got all the material like in uh, four hours. And we went to China, and that was kind of a success. It also was great because of the language barrier. Uh, like mo- most of the Chinese people do speak English, but not that well. And uh, one, one thing I was like very confused is like you explain to them something and they say, do you understand uh, what, what I just explained? And they say, yeah, 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 very well, very well. And then, <laughs> and then you, you come and see how they tried to pass those unit tests and they didn't understand anything. And uh, being able to verify like their knowledge via unit tests was like very helpful. Okay, <laughs> they try to be polite, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, they're. Uh, but another, like the the cool thing is they basically actually do what you ask them to do. So at some point, I ask them to like, can you please uh, start the repository so we can on GitHub? And like, if I do it in um, in the US course, like two people would do it out of like forty, and I got like thirty eight or something out of forty people. So they actually listen to what you want and they just go and do it. So it's cool. Okay, yeah, that's cool. And uh, then over time, it evolved. At some point, uh, it uh, became kind of official uh, Angular code lab at Google I/O. And uh, fun fact, that's just how I met Derek. Uh, <laughs> I was uh, it, like, it was I think the first uh, time. And I was just uh, running around like crazy looking at the people's monitor. And <laughs> every time I saw somebody trying to do Angular, I was like, ah, we need help. I'm here to help <laughs> because I was super excited. And uh, yeah, and Derek was there and uh, he didn't need help, obviously. <laughs> yeah, but uh, the, I think the first time we met was in uh, in some meetup. 
In no, it was it was I I remember it was Google I/O. Google you, I/O. Yes, you were going to the code lab. And, and then we, we was on on some meetup in Helsinki, maybe. Uh, I think we met on uh, some meetups too later. Uh, I okay. Been in Helsinki, but uh, we, we, yeah, or, somewhere. Yeah, yeah, but it was or in Norway in maybe. Oslo. Oh, were you there? Oh, maybe you were there with yeah, Maxim. Yeah, uh, yeah exactly. Okay. It was Maxim meetup. Yes, hi Maxim. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hi Maxim. Exactly. Yes, but that, that that was after the first that meeting. Was, yeah, was this f- first was Google yes. IO exactly. Yeah, exactly. and then over time we basically got to upgrade it uh, to the latest version of Angular just to keep up with things, and that was hard just because of the weird uh, things. We had TypeScript in the browser. We have Angular compiler in the browser. And I'm uh, yet to move it to Ivy. So we do have uh, it working on Ivy, but I think we still have the old compiler, which will be thrown away at some point. Uh, okay. But it, it, it works. But it uh, works, yeah. yeah. So you can learn. Yes. So you, you can learn just codelab.fun. Uh, I probably should should get back to it and do more stuff with it. Okay. That's perfect. Okay. So let's talk about Firebase. Oh, yes. Yeah, it's uh, you work on Firebase now at Google, yeah. Yep. Now. Okay. How long? Uh, for five years, I think. Five years. It's oh, been yeah. a while, yes. Yeah, it's, it's a while, yeah, exactly. It's a while. Okay, so let's talk about the Firebase state now. What's, what's uh, new in Firebase? What we can expect in uh, next year or next months, next days? So uh, now it's like not the best time to talk about Firebase because we have a conference coming like very, very soon. Okay. And yeah, so it's the best time to talk about that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but all the, all the new features I cannot talk about uh, right now okay. will be announced on the conference. <laughs> I, I'm not sure if the date has been posted, uh, but definitely watch out for that. Uh, check out Firebase Twitter. Uh, but there are like a few things which happened uh, around the summer recently, uh, which I think were pretty cool. Uh, and the first one is uh, we have a modular SDK. Uh, so for those not familiar, Firebase uh, is a set of products which helps us developers to develop uh, better and faster. And one of them is a database which you can talk to from the browser, uh, which is pretty cool. So you don't have to set up anything. You don't need to know Node.js. You literally say like... Uh, write this to the database, read this from the database, and it's real time. And for example, you can create a chat in, and the, the whole chat will be like a few lines of code where one be like, once you write uh, something in an input and press enter, you push it to the database. Uh, we actually don't have a concept of push, it's called add. Uh, but then, uh, because the records are unordered in database. Uh, and then the other one would be like, watch this collection of things, and every time something is added, you display it. And that's it. And that's you, you wrote the whole chat. And uh, you also, on top of that, you need to have some rules. Because if anybody can write and anybody can read, like uh, obviously people will do like really weird things. Uh, so you can say, like, if you created this message and you have an auth for that, there is an auth you can implement in uh, just few lines of code where you can have a login with Google button, login with Facebook, like any auth provider, or you can have username and password where we take care of sending emails and uh, all, all the workflows. Uh, so once you log in, you get your user ID, and then you can use that in the rules. And you can say, oh, you're right in a database, but you're not the person who created this record, so sorry, you cannot do that. And um, uh, on top of that, so we have database, I mentioned auth, and we have uh, 20 other different products. And then the SDK, uh, which you use in a browser to do all those things, that has been updated. (laughs) So that was a very long intro to what happened. And what they did is they basically went... uh, they kind of did an RxJS flip thing where uh, for a while RxJS would have a bunch of methods uh, where you would uh, create an observable and you do something like a dot map and then like uh, increase the number or something, then you do dot filter. And having all those methods on the object uh, was not a great experience. And RxJS tried different things uh, with the prototype and it was not easy to add uh, custom operators. So what RxJS did is um, now you do observable and then you do dot pipe 
and then you throw in a bunch of operators, map, filter, whatever you want. Uh, each of them are imported separately from RxJS slash operators, I think. And then uh, the rest, if they're not used, they're to shaked and thrown away. And this way you don't need... Uh, well, first of all, you don't get the operators you don't use in the bundle. And uh, uh, s second, uh, you can easily add your custom operators, which is like pretty easy. It's a function which takes observable, returns observable. Uh, so Firebase did something very similar. Uh, um, it's not operators, of course, because Firebase doesn't have operators, but most of the methods uh, have been turned into a function which takes uh, the object, uh, which it used to be a method of, and then uh, maybe some arguments. Uh, so right now you basically have a method which is like a, a function, initialize application, for example, you import that, and then you have another function, you import initialize auth or get auth, and then you have a function, for example, sign in with a pop-up uh, where you pass the instance of auth and then some whatever configuration is needed. So everything is a function. And that's, that's kind of the new thing. And uh, Firebase was kind of notorious for giant bundles and it's not a thing anymore, which is pretty cool. Uh, I was not directly involved, but uh, I, I know like lots of uh, people worked on that very hard for a while. And it's also like a mentally a very hard change uh, because like it's completely different API. You basically have to redo everything and uh, you don't even know like if people will like it or not. Um, Okay, a lot of great information. Thank you so much. So uh, I'm now I'm looking forward for this conference. Uh, yeah, that, that was actually announced a while ago. So this uh, not not uh, there will be like even cooler things. I assume, uh, as, as I mentioned, I just been on vacation. Uh, but uh, one thing I'd like to add about this is um, just because now you have to import. Uh, everything, uh, auto-importing kind of becomes essential. And uh, right now, it seems like WebStorm is not supporting it uh, really well. And we're still trying to figure out like what what it is exactly. Uh, but uh, I, I think this is uh, in the way the package is uh, structured. So what uh, we have is a bunch of packages, uh, a bunch of uh, subfolders, each of them has a packet JSON, and each packet JSON has a typing uh, file. And VS Code kind of understands this, mm -hmm. but uh, WebStorm, WebStorm works, or like IntelliJ IDs, they work in a little bit different way. Uh, so what they actually do is they look at the root packet JSON, and they look at um, uh, the typings file there, and if they see it, they're like, okay, this is a TypeScript package, that makes sense, and then they go deeper. But uh, if they don't see the typing field, and we don't, and probably should, I'll, then it uh, starts to use their own methods to analyze it, and uh, that doesn't work as great. Uh, so there is a hack now. If you're using, for example, a Firestore, you can install at Firebase slash Firestore, and then you get all the um, typings. Uh, yeah, and then ho hopefully that will be fixed either from WebStorm side or from our side. We'll have to figure it out. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. It was um, a great pleasure to host you today. Yeah. Uh, uh, there was uh, one more thing I wanted to share. Ah, uh, okay, <laughs> yeah, let's do yes. it. Uh, uh, we, as I mentioned before, so you have this database and you have um, rules, and sometimes you have multiple requests on your page, and then the uh, some of the rules will fail and what you'll get is a 403 error in your console and it might be very confusing as of which rule uh, f uh, failed. Uh, so we do have, and we had for a while, uh, Firebase emulators, uh, which is basically a set of uh, tools uh, you can run where you can talk to your local version of Firebase. And this, this is pretty cool because you basically can develop offline too. And uh, recently there was like a new uh, tab added where it allows you to monitor all requests which are made. So we have a separate UI in, uh, in the emulator and you get to monitor like what requests are made and you can see, I think, which rules uh, fired. And that's a great uh, tool for debugging like what exactly is happening with uh, your app. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's really, that well said. One word, <laughs> two words, well said. Okay, so uh, I have a few non-technical non questions, if yeah, I can yeah. ask. Let's do it. Uh, what kind of person is 
KIRJS. How do you see yourself? I'm I know it's a hard question, so think a moment and say. I, I have, uh, I don't know, magical ability of uh, decreasing emotion density. I don't know how to explain it, uh, but basically when I feel negative emotions, I can kind of like uh, decrease the intensity of it. And because of that, I'm very chill. Like if people like are screaming at each other, like at that point, I would be like, nah, nah, okay. I, 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 I'm feeling I'm mad. I acknowledge that, but I don't have to scream at anybody. And uh, yeah, I, I guess because of that, I, I like to sit and like think about things before committing. Uh, so I guess that's uh, one of the main difference between me and other people. And Maybe even unfortunately because of that you won't see me involved in, I mean, may, maybe yet, maybe it will happen, but in many conflicts on Twitter or anywhere, uh, which is great thing on one hand, but it's uh, kind of sad on the other because uh, conflict is a great uh, way of people to learn about you and uh, people love conflict, everybody. I, I love I love reading about conflicts. Like there was yeah. like very interesting uh, one with the color libraries. I don't know if you followed no, no. Uh, so there was a whole story. So, so there is a chalk, chalk, uh, which is a thing which allows you to color things in a terminal. And okay. there is a lightweight alternative and uh, called Colorette. And um, there was a, uh, there is a guy, his name is Andrei Sitnik. He's a friend of mine. He's a, he's generally a great guy. And he, he really loves performance. He really loves small things and he really loves uh, quick things. Uh, so uh, he is maintaining post CSS, and at some point he's like uh, disagreed on some strategy with the author of Colored, even though he contributed uh, before uh, to Colored. Yeah. And he's like, "Oh, I'm familiar with code base. So what I'm gonna do? Uh, I'm gonna take Colored. I'm gonna take another library called Clur, and I'm gonna merge them together. And I have my own library, and he called it Nano Colors. And it will be faster. It will be smaller. It will be like better in all ways." Uh, but just because he was uh, merging those two together, uh, he didn't keep any. Um, it was like a fork. It was. It seemed like it's like a new library. There was no commit history. Uh, there was like no proper attribution. There was no. I think because of the license, there should have been a license attribution uh, or something. Uh, basically, it didn't go like really well. And um, he created this library, and he's like, "Oh, I'm gonna go to Babel, and I'm gonna go to ESLint, to all the huge libraries, and I'm gonna replace Chalk because my library is so much better." Uh, but the library, the author of the original library, uh, got really mad because, uh, uh, I mean, there was like lots of work he put in that, and so he went into the pull request and he wrote like a whole very long post saying like, "Hey, this." Uh, this was my work and now they're trying to merge it under a different name and there was like a whole drama and like people start coming in saying I created a library which is in faster and smaller and then uh, Sindri came who is like the creator of Chalk and they, then he said oh we have lots of dependencies but now we have plans to not have dependencies anymore and we'll have a new version coming soon and then uh, and then he created another library which uh, was like uh, even smaller and like thousand times faster but like with some limited functionality and that was I thought it was very cool because it raises awareness about like the size of libraries uh, even though like uh, like people getting mad at each other, at each other is <laughs> definitely not a great thing uh, but like there's like, a lot a lot to learn in just uh, looking at the communication looking at how things uh, went through uh, looking at the code of the libraries and uh, I, I guess most of the people didn't even know probably uh, that there were like uh, different libraries to color things in the terminal and now people know. So while I'm kind of happy there are like not that much conflicts around me, uh, on the other hand, there are some good consequences of conflicts. So, yeah. so uh, how you start working with Google? How this journey begin? Uh, so it was, uh, it's a funny story. I was uh, working on consulting and we were working in a big bank and there was like one specific project which was kind of, it was a hard project. The person on the other side uh, uh, was really good at negotiating and uh, was always pushing uh, for us to do more. 
And while generally as a consultancy company, we were pretty good at uh, pushing back and saying no. Like he did it and I, I participated in just a couple of meetings and I saw like the way he explains things is like, yeah, I think he's right. I think we should uh, spend two extra days and do this stuff for free for him. Um, so that was the hard pro project. And the reason I joined there is because uh, the guy who was there uh, just joined Google. And I was like, okay, that, that, that's cool. And uh, then another person who works with me on the same project joins Google, and then another, and then my manager joins Google. Okay. And, I, <laughs> and I was like, I guess I'm going to join Google. And then in uh, in a couple of months... You just, have no choice. Yes, I, <laughs> it, it's my fate. And yeah. in, in a couple of months, uh, I get a message from a recruiter at, on LinkedIn and i'm just super chill about it i'm like yeah i, I i'll go to let's do it yeah yeah i, I did spend like a couple of months uh, studying brushing up algorithms and stuff uh but in the end it was just i didn't even have a phone interview uh i, I don't know exactly why but um, yeah the interview went well and i got into google and then like a uh, super fun fact uh after that um uh, Well, first of all, another person who worked <laughs> with me on this thing joined Google just like a few months ago. Okay. But after that, probably because everybody was leaving, they basically stopped uh, doing stuff with our company. They hired another company. And it was super fun to meet somebody at the Angular Meetup who was working with a different company but on the same project. Well, you, you can guess where this person <laughs> spent next two years working. <laughs> also got into <laughs> Google. So that was mind-blowing for me. <laughs> Okay, that's that's crazy. Do you have some hints for us um, regarding self-organization? Uh, I would say no guilt. Mm -hmm. Just uh, whatever you do, uh, learn lessons, change things, but uh, try to avoid guilt because that doesn't help. It just takes you in the wrong direction. It might help you short term, but like in the long term, I don't think it helps. Okay. So if you try something, you say, "Oh, I have to do this or that," and it doesn't work. Just just chill and try it next time. That's then, that's great. That's great. I, tip. I, I I just learned yesterday from you that you stopped eating sugar, so maybe I'm the one who should be <laughs> asking you this question because <laughs> I, I I'm still not there. But also, I'm not. I don't feel guilty about it. So. Yeah. It's, um. So how does a typical work day at Google look like for you? Uh, so it changed a lot since COVID and the baby. Um, but basically, I, uh, I, I wake up really early, but it uh, right now it depends on the nanny. So the nanny, baby's nanny comes at eight, and I try to help with the baby before that. And that's where I start working. So I try to get, I literally have a, a four or five hour meeting on my calendar every day saying like focus time. And since it's early, like, uh, and uh, lots of people I have meeting with are on um, West Coast time zone. So that's, that is allowed. And uh, this is where, where I focus. And then uh, around lunchtime, I have an hour to um, stream something. That's where I stream. I try to stream during the day because it's uh, evening in Russia. That's like perfect time. And uh, then after that, I usually like do meetings and stuff. And uh, if I still have... Uh, Sometime I just do do code. Uh, I'm very aggressive against meetings. Like if uh, I don't feel I'm useful there, then I just uh, try to avoid. And uh, I just say no. It doesn't always work, but uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, what about your work-life balance? Uh, do you have some hints? I, I don't have life, I have a work baby balance. So okay. I, I, I'm either, either working or I'm sitting with a baby, that's it. Okay, what's the name? It's uh, Baby Max. Max, okay. Yes, and, uh, Hi, Max. <laughs> <laughs> yes, hopefully he'll be watching that. But he participates in uh, my streams. Uh, he, he overheard somebody swearing, and then uh, I had a stream, and... Uh, So we had a cool series of streams uh, with a beginner developer uh, and we wanted to go like whole path. We had, uh, I think, four or five episodes, uh, all in Russian, uh, but uh, where we would uh, uh, show, uh, talk to him, try to understand his goals, try to find him a company, try to help him with the resume, uh, try to... Um, 
uh, do the, some like coding task together and there was a coding task he did it didn't go well and I was like okay next stream I'll show you how like uh, what are other ways to do the same and uh so I was uh, with a baby, he was around, and I was quiet because there were like five other people talking about stuff. And at some point, they're like, okay, now is the coding time. And the moment I start talking, he realizes I'm in the room. And then he comes, and he starts swearing on the stream, and then he starts bringing me stuff. And I, all, all I had to do is like write a five-minute uh, function, but it <laughs> took me 15 <laughs> minutes because every every five seconds, he would come and say, hey, take this car. And I was like, oh, thank you. And then, so that, that, yeah. that was fun. He definitely is a big participant in my streams uh but yeah i'm, I'm hoping he'll forget all the bad words soon <laughs> <laughs> okay uh Kir, thank you thank you so much for being with us today uh it was a great pleasure to host you and uh, yeah, it's it's amazing. You are here in Warsaw, uh, and uh, we can meet to record record this podcast. Yes. So one more time, thank you, thank you so much. Cool. Thanks a lot for inviting. It was amazing uh, for me because, uh, as I mentioned, I'm doing most of my streams and stuff in Russian, and it's uh, really cool. Now I'm starting to forget English, so it's really cool to do some something in English. So thanks, Derek. Thank you so much. <laughs>